All right, bang bang! It's the mid show. It's Thursday. It is Thursday. Yep. We got a loaded one for you. We got Northwestern head football coach David Braun coming on, along with Michael Cerami, Cerami, Cerami of uh, Bleacher Nation to talk some Cubs. Mm-hmm. Ed is out today. I guess he's he's on his flight out to like UCLA to go camp. Ed's out, so we replace him with three guests. That's what yeah, we, yeah, pretty we got, much. We yeah. got Braun. We got our NFC North guy, uh, Henkel from Detroit. Talk a little football schedule release. And then we got Cerami for the Cubs. Big show, loaded Big show, show, fun show. Uh, and it's all brought to you by who? The great tasting, less filling Miller Lite. Now, look, lots have changed over the years. One thing hasn't. There's been one constant in my life. What is that constant, That's Miller, Chief? That's Miller Lite. And another thing that hasn't changed is that it's just less filling. You ever notice that? It it's, doesn't. It's great like, tasting and no, less filling. People are trying to. We've been debating this forever. They've been dating, debating it since 1975. Which is more important? Great states, less filling. I can't decide. What do you have? A, you have a, a vote? Do you have a vote? I do not. I like okay. them both. I likes them both. Everybody likes them both. That's a good thing. Yeah. Because Miller Lite's got them both. Yeah. Miller Lite keeps it simple undebatable quality great taste only 96 calories it's the beer that strips away everything you don't need and holds on to what matter most it's a light beer that tastes like beer less filling only 96 calories the original light beer since 1975 so you don't even have to choose with miller light good because we can't if you want to have it delivered right to your door you go to millerlight.com slash mid show or i mean this is chicago just walk in any place that sells beer. They're going to have Miller Lite. It's Chicago's beer. It's also the official beer of the Chicago Bears. Everything trending up for Miller Lite, for Barcelona Chicago, for the Chicago Bears. And we basically just brought in Henkel to try to bully him and rattle That's him a exactly little bit about the Lions. So do. thank you for joining us for a little bully session. Uh, it's schedule release day. It's a very exciting day. I can't Football can't get here soon enough. So what we know so far, recording on Wednesday before the full schedule has been uh, been released, we do know a few things. We know week one, home versus the Titans. I feel like that's a soft landing spot for our boy Caleb Williams. Home game, everybody's going to be hyped. I hope it's just like a noon kick, like just standard, like get right into being a Chicago Bear. Week two, the Lovey Bowl. I feel like he should flip the coin. It's Texans and Bears down there. We be, we both got a quarterback thanks to Lovey a couple of years ago with a Hail Mary refusing to just roll over. That was great. I think we should both build him a statue. Lovey's the best. Uh, and then we have Packers to end the year. We got Seahawks are going to be Sunday night is what the leaks are saying, or Thursday night, I should say. Thursday night, week 17, we know. So it's starting to trickle out a little bit. And the big one for me, my favorite thing, Bears on Thanksgiving. It's my least favorite. Why is that your least favorite? I like having a little bit of variety. I meant to look this up. I did not. It feels like... Thanks for doing your homework. The last... I was working on something else. I was working on (laughs) schedule release. It feels like, out of the last 10 years, emphasis on feels like. Mm -hmm. Seven out of those 10 years have been the Bears. Wrong. I know. This is very much... I am aware that this is coming from like a butthurt, no evidence space. Yeah. But I am so sick of playing. It's it seems like it's often the NFC North teams that does feel. We come fine. in and steal your. We come in and steal your turkey. Like last year, the Packers ruining my Thanksgiving. Yeah, I wasn't in the mood for that. Mm-hmm. I didn't want that. It seems like we've actually had the ability to hold our own against the Packers for a while now. You yeah. have been a blessing. The one day that I really, really, really wanted to beat the Packers, we didn't. Mm-hmm. I don't want, and I've I've told you guys this before, I'm being dead serious, and you only get this for a year. I do want the Bears to be good this year. Good is, there's a range of good, Mm -hmm. but I love good football more than anything. And good football in the NFC North is the best. Black and blue. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. It's going to be really good. There's no like weak team. No. And I like that. So you guys being good, I am excited about. If you guys ruin my Thanksgiving, I'm going to be. Furious. Here's why I love playing the Lions on Thanksgiving. It's better than playing the Cowboys. Playing the Cowboys, that kicks off like, you know, your mom's calling you up. You got to eat dinner. You got to talk to your aunt. You got to do all these different things like right in the middle of the game because that's when those kicks are. That that game starts at 11, basically, the Thanksgiving game, Central mm-hmm. Time. 
So you have all you have your bears filled, then you go get your turkey fill, and the game's kind of background noise. It is perfect. It's even better when you just ruin ruin their day, like their day. It's like their their little holiday. Well, it is Super Bowl. For, yeah. is their day for we, yeah. kinda yeah. Last but it's hard to be like it's our day when everyone just comes in and steamrolls you. That's what sucks. Is yeah, we've been around. Last season was our 90th season. I don't remember exactly how far back uh, the Thanksgiving Day game goes. A long time. Mm-hmm. As long as it, uh, I've been, yeah, around, yeah. correct. Right, I right. hate. I think it's the fifties. I hate being a Lions fan to admit this. For a long time, that was like the one thing we can hang our hat on. It's like Thanksgiving belongs to us, and around the country, because we were the Lions of old for so long, same old Lions. It was like a tradition for the country yeah. to yeah. say Thanksgiving starts with somebody beating up on the Lions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm aware of. It's kind yeah. of funny. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sick of it. I want to win on Thanksgiving. It's not like I, to the point about I want good football. I love good football. I don't want, if we're going to play the Bears on Thanksgiving, I don't want a rollover opponent on Thanksgiving. I don't, I don't want to just bully. Uh, I can't think of like a nobody. What's, a t- what's year, a, but. it? It would be the Lions. Not this year. No, I know, but historically. Historically, who, yes. Who's some fucking doormat that we can, well, it's like you're looking and at And I America, don't want dude. to do that. Yeah. So. This if it's going to be you guys, it's going to be competitive. Great. Yeah. But I am sick of seeing it's you guys and the Packers that I I just don't have any fun seeing you guys on Thanksgiving. And it's just it, there's nothing that I can like back it up with. But are these our matchups? Yeah. Are these the Thanksgiving Day games historically. Yeah. So, so we've played yeah. four out of the last ten. All right. So you're not you're not yeah. far yeah, off. Okay. But like that's odds are you know you're going to play a division opponent if you're playing us twice a year. One I of them. Guess. Yeah. Yeah, I I love it. It's one of my favorite things. I I think I'm I'm so excited for the Bears, and I I feel like the league with the, if if the leaks for the schedule are true, the league is acknowledging that the Bears are cool. If you have the Packers primetime week eighteen, no, they the Bears get they've historically gotten way too many primetime games. Yeah, and, but like if you have Thanksgiving, that's a that's a showcase game. Yeah. yeah. You have Week 18 Packers that are supposedly going to be prime time. It's probably going to be that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, you have uh, Vikings are going to have a prime time game with the with the Bears. They they released. I can't remember which week that was. They have Thursday night against the Seahawks. Like you're looking at like five to six nationally televised games yeah. for the Chicago Bears. Like that is what they have last year. Three. They typically have three. I, yeah, so is, this could be but double they that. Doormats too. Right. Like they played the Panthers last year. It was like the worst game of all time. They the Vikings. It was like the worst game of all time. This is like, hey, like the Bears are actually kind of. Yeah, kinda I fun, I, cool. I typically I hated prime time because it was to, it, to prime time point, Bears. Yeah, it was you, like that we would talk about. It. Like even when they were, had good years, with the exception of like the Arizona game. You know, who do they? You know, the, the old. There's Denny a Green handful club. of games. Where it's they were in prime time and they they it was the complete like the Patriots game a couple of years ago where they just beat the shit out of the Patriots yeah and it was I think that was a Thursday night game it was like at, the week after they had but lost. typically they're doing something to embarrass themselves yeah that is not the case anymore no. I I I'm so fully on board with the direction of this organization yeah. and and my confidence in them finally finding the quarterback of their future that I I give me all the primetime games the other thing I want to show off this fucking organization the to everybody on the the know. other thing that's fun about week one too you know Taylor and Will are going to be here yep so we'll have a live stream where we get to instead of bullying Hinkle we get to mm-hmm. bully two former NFL guys yep. and just like that's like hey we're announcing are like the that the bears are here hopefully hopefully it goes that way if they if they have a nice week one that's a good way to start now i will say i've never been this confident in the direction of the bears out like not even close the yeah. next closest would be that 2019 yeah was that or 20 no, they, when we when we watched it at DraftKings in new york or whatever that was against the Packers when he did yeah, the team was, formation and he 20, came out yeah. wearing the tweet. That was cap. that was that was the year after the double, the first game after the double doink. So 2019. Yeah. Yep. And um, they just threw up an egg. Yeah. And it was ugly. Well, and it was embarrassing. That that would be worst possible case scenario, and it would like I'd be eating a lot of crow for all the shit I plan on talking yeah. about the Bears this summer. Right, but we're just at the start of it, and that <laughs> that game too, like that even that felt different. Like you had a real defense. But it was like, can Mitch just get like a little bit better and be like a like an average quarterback? Nope. That was like that was the hope. And it's like if he's average, if he's like the twelfth to fifteenth best quarterback in the league, like we got a real shot. Mm-hmm. That didn't happen. I got a question for you. 
Um, this is based on and, and you because you were on that show months ago. I don't when we uh, discussed how I said the li- lions stink. don't. St- I never said they stink. You said, said they have a stink on them. Yes, that they, it's they a stinky shaken. organization. Yeah. Uh, I, but I got, I got a ton of shit saying, uh, because I said originally the lions don't scare me Mm -hmm. now. Do they, have they scared you over the last couple of years? Uh, I do have a take on this, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, the last couple of years, no last it's it's, or moving forward. They're not, they're not the boogeyman like the Packers are like, you have to do it longer than one one season. Understand, but, but the way they play football. Which is just like biting kneecaps, like like they said right when the coach got hired. Like they're they're like a nasty football team now. They will, they're a team that will never roll over in my eyes. Like it's gonna be a, it's like you know, we're talking to Coach Braun later, like rock fight kind of game, no matter mm-hmm. what. So yeah, like scared, no, but like my point my point is this, and we're gonna get to the Jared Goff conversation after this segue because this is all tied together. My point is this is. You said that Jared Goff does not scare you. This Correct. is off camera. And mm-hmm. I don't think you can be afraid of a football team if the quarterback himself doesn't scare you, per se, most of the time. Yeah, and most I like Jared Goff. He's I like Jared Goff. He's a good yeah. quarterback. Yeah. He's a very good quarterback. But he doesn't scare me. Correct. Even yeah. though he's been to the NFC Championship. Super Bowl. And Super Bowl. Yeah. Two different organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he's So that that is where I am dollars. doubling down and saying the Detroit Lions do not scare me. Now, the Detroit Lions in this current iteration of them are a very good football team. Yep. And on that note, I think this extension of Jared Goff makes it a do-or-die year for 2024-25. That has definitely been the word on the street. Like Everybody that has a take on it, it's either we overpaid for Jared or – I guess just to that point is like you are so tied up in everything that you have this year. We got both coordinators to come back. Nobody thought that was going to happen again. Yeah. We extended Jared. We extended Panay. We extended Amon Ra. We still have, I think after this season, we have to look into signing Aiden Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. To an There's a lot of players that need to be played, paid. Yeah. And, and players ones. that have been play, paid already. Yes. That's right. Point. So the one thing that I will say that has been very different to really just like wrap my head around or even use as like ammo in a conversation like this is we have competency in our front office like top to bottom within our organization seems to be that way yeah we have people who have a full plan for whether it's just the roster the facilities the like the uniform thing that was discussed apparently like day one dan campbell got hired and he's like i would like to get new uniforms and black uniforms at that and then they did that so between that, um, I I do not understand how money works in sports in the sense that Jared Goff is getting a lot of money. I don't have a problem with it. I'm actually very, more than anything, I'm just relieved that we got it out of the way. Um, but when it comes to like guaranteed money versus... Oh, it's, you have to have an MIT or economics yeah. degree. Money like on the books versus doesn't count toward the cap, like Ed all cap that. And, yeah, I try to stay out of that so much and just let like the Brad Holmes of the world deal with that because I can't. It's so confusing yeah. and it changes all the time. You think of like the Rams, the Saints, whatever. They just make up their own way to spend money. So to that point about this season, I don't have that same sense of urgency i guess because i don't think that the money is necessarily going to be an issue like a few years ago when we extended matthew stafford he became on that contract the highest paid quarterback in nfl history i think it was within that same week that whether it was for some reason jimmy g is the guy who comes to mind someone got a contract to one up him within seven days this is one of those things i will never understand about quarterback contracts in the nfl who are the lions bidding against who are like you know what i mean like who what where is the just law that top that yeah. Top, yeah why 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 just be like hey we're gonna offer you half of what um you know the chargers are paying and like all these other teams with like more premier like elite type quarterbacks that are younger and in their prime like and if you can get a better offer i guess go get it and which i guess the the vikings did get burned by that with kirk cousins but like it's one of those things where it's like, who says you have to just pay top dollar for a quarterback? The I work it, but like, but again, the market, they? Would, the market would indicate that, uh, that like this says like, what is he the fourth highest paid quarterback in the league? 
his annual salary, I think, I think he's it's, number two behind Burrow. All right. Why? Dude, that's my point. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how money works. It doesn't make any sense. The one thing, to your point about, like, who you're competing against, the quarterback thing, I'm hands off. It doesn't make any sense. Quarterbacks are just going to get top dollar, whatever. Live with it, I they guess, say. to some degree. They say. All right. Fair. The one, they. Good point, Dave. The yeah. one thing that I do like that we did is the contract that we gave Amon Ross St. Brown seemingly sets the market for the Vikings having to load up on Justin Jefferson mm-hmm. and how that affects their books. And they're not starting over, but they're not not starting over. I think I we're still going to be started. competitive, yeah. but I think going into the season, the expectation is that they'll finish fourth in the division. Right. But, well, hopefully. But but they're they're also in a position where they don't have to pay a quarterback. Correct. So, that's, so they can afford just Correct. So it's, yeah. like I said, when it comes to cash space and money and everything, people try to be so smart about it on Twitter. I'm not. I, I'm hands off. Like yeah. I said, it, it doesn't make any sense. Somebody knows how it works, but the line moves yeah. Every single day. So it is right. what it is. And we'll wrap it up on this. Uh, the Bears are rumored to be one of the contenders to have hard knocks. Mm-hmm. I want it. Do you want it? I want it, yeah. What would you – you just went through it. <clears throat> Do you think that that was a net positive for the Lions? Yeah. Okay. In the public eye. Yeah. Everybody they, loves Dan Campbell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I – word on the street – I'm not saying this is my opinion. This is the collective consensus that I've seen. People thought that that was, whether it was the best entire season of Hard Knocks or just the best first two, three episodes, because everybody starts I, to I fall like off was, after that. I felt like it was the best Hard Knocks in a while when the Lions Fair. did it. Yeah. yeah. Since, so, like, since like Rex Ryan's Jets ones. I, hand up, had never watched Hard Knocks okay. up to the Lions doing it because I, like I said earlier about liking good football, Hard Knocks is not football to me. Like I like it's I the, I like it's the, the nuts and bolts. It's the innards. It's I the like guts. the X's and O's and everything of football. And obviously, like watching on Sundays. This is the X's and O's. It's what goes into roster construction. So I didn't realize that going into Hard Knocks, I thought it was more drama, if you will. It's not the and, real world, man. <laughs> so. Going into it, I, or when it got announced that we were going to do it, I was honestly a little hesitant to be excited just because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't want the distractions. I didn't want the, I don't even mean to use the word drama like it's a soap opera, but um, I just didn't know how pure football it was because I never cared to watch it. Um, then I watched it, absolutely loved it. This past season, I don't remember who did it. Um, exactly. Jets. Jets again. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, for you guys, I think it could be cool, but I think in most yeah. years I would be like, eh. This, n- but this, like, you need to have the personality. You got personalities, so, right? There's one. so much hype. There's so much like intrigue. You got the quarterback. You got all that stuff. Like, I want, I want all the Bears content. I watched highlight tapes of mini camp the other day. I have been watching all 22 videos of Caleb Williams for months, fucking months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lance, where are you on that? Do you want hard knocks? Well, <clears throat> since Eddie's not here, I guess I might be our resident Eeyore. Okay. No lie, I don't. I think that, especially with the beginning, right? I think adding the cameras and adding this flash to it and then not succeeding is just going to have the entire world pile on to Caleb. Fuck that. Early. Be confident, oh. Lance. This I is love- going to be a good football team this year. I'm not calling Super Bowl I, or nothing yeah. or even playoffs this year, but you are going to start to see – not not the gleam. It's going to be very obvious that this team is going to be fucking loaded in the, like for yeah. a good stretch, a good stretch. I, I I almost need to see it. I don't know. It's only, I, like, I, I I have my as my heart been broken by the Bears so many times that I just I can't love again. Sure, you know? but like I'd love to. But this Loving is different. Fun. It's different. I do different. think that they said that about Fields. They said that I never said that about Fields. There's always been for Fields. So the the quarterbacks, the at least in the the relevant quarterbacks that the Bears have drafted in my, we'll call it adult life, has been Rex Grossman, uh, Kyle Orton was a fourth rounder, but I'm talking, I'm not even really talking about him, uh, Trubisky and Fields. Trubisky obviously was a stress. They traded off for him. They got they got fucking swindled by John Lynch in the Niners. Uh, Fields was a trade up. 
Um, and he uh, he was falling in that draft, and it was obvious like he had there was question marks. This is so much different than those guys. This was the consensus from start to finish. Yeah, one one best pro prospects in the draft, and they got him. And I love his personality. Me too. I love how it felt flamboyant and like. He just, these guys look like they're best fucking friends kind of, already. He's kind of a fucking dude, man. He's like, a he's yeah. a fucking dude. Yep. He's a dude. And and those cameras, like, give him all the cameras. That's not gonna shake him. Yep. So, he and, and we're, we're, we've talked about how it's the first uh Gen Z quarterback or NIL guy or however yeah, we yeah. phrased it a couple of weeks ago that has gone through the draft so process. That was Pulse who said that. Yeah, he's used to he's that. used to having a yeah. fucking phone and camera and, and and recording in front of his face. Yep. Give me all of it. Yep. I and Selfishly, it'd be good for us. Yeah, probably get some like us as in vlogs. Yeah, fuck it, yeah, fire yeah. me up. Let's go. Right. Right. Am I wrong? No, am no. I wrong? I don't not think wrong. you're wrong. I will Actually, say, am I wrong? Now that's not to say Caleb Williams could absolutely be a bust, but the process that led to Caleb Williams and and all and everything that's been said about him, I'm obviously not some pro scout eye, but like everything that's said about him, I think the chances are pretty good that. Yeah, like the floor is is it's so there, high. It, it's I think it's fair to be optimistic for the like genuinely optimistic for the, maybe the first time. And I time. and when it comes to the Bears, like I have no problem. Yeah, you taking probably, my you, Bears blinders off and my Chicago fandom blinders off, I will speak exactly how I see. I even think if this that is, is against the this game. is a good look for you because you've always been the like the pessimistic one. I'd say. Of the group, yeah. Well, I, I, now I it's but like it's not you, me being pessimistic. Is me. That, that's what I'm saying. I'm giving speaking you, I'm, what I see is Dave. Truth. I'm giving yeah. you credit because you're not just an EOR for EOR sake. That's what I'm saying. No, I'm not. All right. All right. Well, I think that's uh, you know we'll we'll probably do our full breakdown where we predict the Bears to go 17 and 0 with Big Cat like we do every year yep. next week when the schedule is fully out. Um, and with that, we're gonna keep talking football. Head football coach at Northwestern, David Braun. I. I might be in love with this guy. He's the he, guy's the man. Uh, so he is awesome. That's coming up now, and we'll see you on the other side. Whoosh! All right, but before we get to Coach Dave Braun, the head football coach at Northwestern, I want to talk to you guys about Vander Hagen, the absolute best razor in the game. Make the switch from a cartridge razor to a safety razor today with Vander Hagen. Safety razors allow you to get a closer, more comfortable shave. The one. Uh, Blade razors help prevent nicks and cuts while making your feel your skin feel smoother than ever. The best part, these blades cost as little as $1 a piece and last anywhere from three to five shaves. This will save you thousands of dollars over the years compared to the cost of cartridge razors. These blades are ice-tempered, stainless steel blades from Germany. You know they're good. You hear anything engineered out of Germany, you know it's an A-plus product. That's Vanderhagen for you. They're so sharp, they'll give you that perfect shave every time. The handle is made to last a lifetime, so the only recurring purchase you have will is for the blades themselves. So check out your local Target and Rite Aid to get yourself a Vanderhagen safety razor today. We're all using them. We're all feeling good. No nicks, no cuts, no burn, no nothing. That's because we use uh, Vanderhagen. Uh, so check out that local target, uh, vanderhagen.com. All right, we're in the interview portion of this week's episode. One of the interviews, uh, we're sitting down with uh, Northwestern head football coach David Braun. Now, if you would have told me about a year and a half ago that I was sitting down with head coach David Braun, I would have said, you are absolutely insane. Fitz is going to be here the next 50 years until he decides to go. Um, you probably would have said that too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I thought we were taking one of the most stable jobs in college yep. football. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, what? So uh, we don't have to get into the whole thing. It's been relitigated a million times over. But like, I just want to get like a brief summation of the. Were, were there any buyer's remorse? Like, oh man, I wish I wouldn't take this job, taking another one, or was it instant? Like, all right, this is what we got. Got to move forward. Let's do it. Yeah, you know. Our time at North Dakota State was so special. Um, it was going to take something really special to pull Kristen and I and our family out of Fargo. And, uh, you know, we we thought we were taking our, our dream job. You know, again, like I said, we thought we were taking one of the most stable jobs in all of college football and working with great people and, you know, an hour and 15 minutes from my folks. And, I mean, there was just – you know, I, I I grew up watching Northwestern football, Wisconsin football, Big Ten through and through. My dad's from Cleveland, Ohio State fan. I mean, he's like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. You get to be a defensive coordinator yeah. in the Big Ten. And, uh, yeah, I'd be lying to you if I t didn't tell you there were some times in July and August that my wife and I are going, what 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 did we get ourselves into? I mean, the, so much uncertainty. Uh, 
but you know at the end of the day we got we got such an incredible group of guys that we get to coach that you know all all that energy just got turned into you know how can we make sure that these guys have an incredible experience this fall and and to their credit i mean they they more to, in, th- than delivered on that i mean the the memories uh, are are memories that will stick with me forever how was I, before we get into all the Northwestern stuff, I've been obsessed with the Fargo Dome and North Dakota State. Like you, they had game day there a couple of times. It looks like the most unique atmosphere for college football. What what was it like as a coordinator on game day walking into that place? Guys, you you, you got to go. I mean, yeah. you, you, you got to rent an RV. You got to go up. Um, we used to joke in the defensive staff room at NDSU. You know, Nick Gazer, Buddha Williams, Grant Olson, like all of us, Cody Morgan, we used to say, like, guys, when we retire, like we are coming back yeah. kicks because yeah. as a coach, you right. experience the game yeah, and right. the home field advantage, but you walk past the tailgate and you're like, I want to, I want to experience that. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it's incredible. How loud is it getting there compared to some of these big 10 places you've uh, coached at? It, it, it's wild. You know, um, you, you put 20,000 people that are amped up, ready to go, especially, you know, in, in a dome and it is the ultimate home field advantage. And, you know, with with uh, this this lakefront pop up that we got going right now, mm-hmm. you know, I know a lot of people are like, "Well, what's what's the, what's the capacity?" At, at the end of the day, what what it really comes down to is, you know, those that show up ready to roll, uh, primarily purple, and yeah. uh, let's let's turn it into home field advantage. And that that transition to the new Ryan Field in 2026, it's the right size. It fits us. If we can, when 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 we build this momentum over the course of the next two years. You know, it's not always about the numbers in the stadium. Uh, it's about who's in the stadium, the energy that they're bringing. And we learned that firsthand at NDSU. I mean, I, I would be the first to tell you the the string of national championships that, that we were able to be a part of, so much of that, that had to had to do with the fact that we had home field advantage throughout the playoffs, and especially for teams that hadn't experienced it before. I mean, it, it was halfway through the second quarter, and – uh, the game a lot of times is already over. Yeah, you yeah. just need thirty thousand White Sox Daves in the in the building. Well, Darn right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you guys built the, and this is way before you even probably were even had Northwestern on their ra- on your radar. But I went to it was a scrimmage against a D two school. I don't even remember what it was at the new basketball stadium in twenty was it eight, eighteen or nineteen or whatever. And my immediate thought was this place is very small and this place is perfect for Northwestern and Riley and I went to a couple games last year when they beat Purdue first uh, ranked Purdue and then 10th ranked or whatever Illinois that place is absolutely perfect for Northwestern and but it's basketball and it's a small it's a you know you can get away in football you got 50,000 almost capacity Ryan Field you dumb that down you get all purple fans that's what I want are, Amen. are you advocating you know, the the Ryan family for a dome just to lock all that noise in? Rob there? was in here a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if we're supposed to say that, but he was. Yeah. <laughs> so. you, you know the, the the thing the thing that's neat, you know, capacity. They're they're they're, they're drawing it back in. Which again, it, it what is fitting to Northwestern and what you're speaking mm-hmm. of, what Welsh Ryan's turned into. It's fitting to Northwestern. It's perfect for them. And 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 the canopy that they're going to have over the new Ryan Field is going to keep the noise mm-hmm. in. Yeah. Again, fitting to Northwestern. Uh, really, really excited about what what we're going to be able to do and what our fan base is going to be able to do. And, with the new venue. and this Lakeville Stadium is it's going to be just like a, a a really quick sprint to that with what is it fifteen thousand I think I read R- roughly, roughly somewhere in there and it's going to be like a, a a Texas high school football game and I can't wait for that. I already told Riley like be prepared for me to badger you for tickets nonstop because I want to be there. Like <laughs> well, you know the coach now can you get yeah, sideline I, passes yeah, for the guy? I mean. <laughs> That is coming later, but in the relationship. But yes, I will be asking. Um, Did you guys exchange numbers yet? How, so when when is like why don't you blitz on this down? When, <laughs> when are you guys uh, breaking ground on that? I'm sure there's a ton of permit BS to go through behind the scenes and all that, but season's coming. Yeah, you know, I I, I don't I don't envy all those that have been involved in the lo- logistics of it. Uh, thank God to to, mm-hmm. to so many people that are on the ins and outs of it right now. Alex Nisley, our director of football operations, has been just an absolute rock star helping all the different pieces that are going on with this. There's others in administration, on campus, so many. You, you don't realize it until you get into the weeds of how many people are really having to team up and make this happen. But, uh, you know, in production, the company that we've teamed with to, to do all this, I mean, this this is what they do. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, so at some point here in the early summer, things are going to get rolling, and and they they got a really thorough plan. Uh, really appreciative of all our other head coaches in the, in the department that 
are navigating, you know, th- this this in some ways is going to affect soccer, men's and women's soccer, affect lacrosse. Um, you know, field hockey's, uh, you know, field and stadium is right next door and you know, everyone's just really come together and and realize that there's going to be have to be some compromise for everyone, football included, but we can make this work and and the the experience that's going to provide for for our guys on game day. Uh, for the fan base, for our students on campus. Oh, I mean, yeah. th- this is what yeah. college football is about. Like, right. you wake up in the morning, 9 a.m., walk out of the dorms, you know. <laughs> Get to that parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. That, that's what it's about. Yep. The environment's going to be special. Teetering yeah. that line of maybe or maybe not getting let into the stadium because you're a little too, you know, lubed up <laughs> from the parking lot. But but like you said, Responsibly. that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what college football is all about. I can't wait. Um Back to the, uh, you know, you took over in kind of unusual circumstances that you didn't expect. Fitz was such a legend here, played, obviously, everyone knows the story. What was something that you had to do to be like, I'm going to put my DNA on this instead of just like as a continuation? What's something that you like, this is what I want in my football team? Yeah, you know, I, I, I got I got two things on that. You know, I, I think one thing that I've been really conscious of you know, throughout my career as a defensive coordinator is, and it's natural, you, you get asked this question a lot, you know, what are you going to do to make it your defense? And mm-hmm. I've always said, guys, it's 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 not my defense, it's, it's our defense. Like, in my opinion, great coaches, what they have the ability to do is understand those that they're working with and contextualize everything. Like, what, what do we need to do with this group to, to put this group in a position to win? And yeah. that, that that's where it started. Okay, let, let's as much as this is a trying time, it provides an opportunity for us to take a step back and say, okay, this group, this group of 103 guys, what, what what do we need to do to put this team in positions to win on Saturdays? And what, what we first identified, it's going to take all 103. And something that we had done at North Dakota State for, for decades was, was double rep. And double repping with 103 guys is not ideal, but you know, we immediately made the decision in fall camp to do some double rep, which is essentially instead of 22 guys taking a rep in practice, 44 guys are taking reps. You split into two fields. You split the coaching staff. You got a young guy's field. I promise you if you go down on that young guy's field, it's going to be some of the ugliest college football you've ever seen early on in camp. Yeah. But you learn by doing. You learn by failing. And some of the development that happened on that field in August – is what resulted in a guy like Michael Kilbane being able to all of a sudden we get into week five, six, seven, eight, and it's like started man, dominating. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. And 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 those things start to pay off. So, you know, it, it was never about you know what do I need to do to make it mine. It was it, it, it a trying time providing an opportunity for us to say you know what what a great opportunity yeah. for us to take a step back and say how do we win with this team? There, there there's a formula out there, you know, but 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 we we're gonna have to find it. We may have to be really creative and. Um, Double repping is something we weren't able to do much in the spring with our lack of depth at O-line. So excited about where we're going to be at this fall camp. We're going to get back into double repping and just, you know, give give as many guys on our team as many opportunities to really grow, develop, and, you know, find their niche and role on the team. Um, on, on that exact note, what what is it that – did you see, like, a transition, like, right off the bat – um, from guys that were buying into your vision, this is our defense, our collective, or did it take some time? Because, like, I as I'm watching on TV and in the stands last year, it it was palpable. I don't even want to – I don't know which game exactly it was, but right around week four, week five, it's like, this so team's not something. that bad. This team's mm-hmm. – it was like kind of like uh, – Major I mean, you, League. Yeah, Major <laughs> League. Guys it, you something. grew up uh, – you said your dad's a Tribe fan. It's kind of like that. For sure. I was like looking around like, these guys aren't that bad. Yeah. You know? No, I, I, I'll tell you what, you know, you – you you know Rutgers was was a was a rough way to open and you, you get a great win against UTEP and you got some confidence going then we go down to Durham and Duke just I mean mm-hmm. man worked us over and but you know all of a sudden that that Minnesota game and you're like okay and 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 before you know it you know there was a certain sense that we can play with anybody and it was palpable and, and from my and, perspective and, no and and and, and I agree from being in the mm-hmm. building and being in the inner workings of it day in and day out I mean there there was a level of confidence within that group that continued to build I think the bowl game's a prime example of that of you know I, I think initially when that got released the matchup there was a certain aura of well, great season. Enjoy your bowl totally. experience, but like, yeah. good luck again. Yeah, Utah. Right. yeah. And our right. guy, our guys were like, screw that. Yeah, like, bring it on. Let, let, let's go. We got a good football team. We're gonna go prepare our, our tails off. You guys and, stomped them. Yeah, and and, yeah. and and go find a way to win. And um, 
But 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 to answer your question directly, I, I think there was you know especially on the defensive side of the ball with a new system, I think as guys started to see really understand what we were trying to do, how we were trying to do it as as a defensive staff as we started to mesh. You know, Coach McGargle, Tim, Tim is just such a such an incredible asset. Leaning into Tim a lot, and, and as we kind of got in our rhythm, you could just start to see a level of confidence and edge that those guys were playing with. That we got to make sure we continue to embody and, and and carry on into into 2024. I wish we had a uh, our, our third chair here, Ed. He's a SIU guy. He's talked about the the Fargo Dome many times because he used to work for the SIU football oh, yeah. program, and he's a St. Pat's guy. So I love it. Gargle's a, a legend to to our guy Ed. Um, he's worked his way up through the program now. He was with Green Bay for a second, and elsewhere, I think Illinois. But um, what has he been doing to like? carry both your torch and the coach hank torch from from years past he's i i don't know how what other way to put it he's a rock star mm-hmm. i mean you know and and those that know tim well know that you know as as you get to know him you know he's he's not the easiest guy to figure out i mean he's just he's just so direct and motivated and driven it's like man th- 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 this guy i mean when is he not thinking about ball which one of the things i love about him <laughs> Dreaming about ball. I, I, yeah. Seriously, yeah. seriously, and uh, you know what? What? What he has meant to this program over the years, what he continues to mean to this program. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited about what he's doing to build off of the foundation that was established last year. But in a new Big Ten and USC and more and more air raids showing up in this league, really finding unique ways to continue to evolve the defense. And I think the thing that was cool that we went through last year as we were building this defense, there was certainly a lot of elements of NDSU defense, uh, but Christian Smith from South Dakota State brought in some really good ideas. We went back and looked at a lot of the things that they had been doing, you know, under Hank and, you know, Tim McGargle and Matt McPherson were obviously familiar with that. There, there's certainly elements of Hank's defense still that are a huge mm-hmm. part of what we're doing. And to be honest with you, even though over the, the the course of the couple years prior to my arrival, there were some things that were going on under Jim O'Neill in the third down package where it's like, j- j- just because we've transitioned, if this works and our guys are familiar with it, like we'd be silly to just eliminate right. the, as long as it all ties together and meshes. And, th- and that's that's what becomes difficult. That's where guys really have to check their egos at the door. You better have a collaborative environment. But, I mean, Tim is the ultimate collaborator, was such an incredible asset to, to us on game day with adjustments. And to be honest with you, the decision to promote him a defensive coordinator uh, is by far one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, I must still be involved with defense, involved with offense, involved with special teams. But, I mean, Tim McGargle is running that room, calling that defense, and he's someone that if I have to step away for even days at a time, the last thing I'm worried about is the way that our defense is. How how difficult has that transition been? Because now they always talk about, like, if you're the head coach, you're kind of a CEO, where you were a specialist before. You've you've never been a head coach until this past year, correct? Correct. So what was that learning curve like where, like, you're getting pulled into – Riley's pulling you into fundraising things. And, like, what has that transition been like? And and do you enjoy that part of it as well? It's it's been wild. I I thoroughly enjoy it, but I am – I am learning every yeah. day. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm battling to keep my head above water every day. I mean, it's it's just a year of first, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, and in season, it kind of insulates you because you're just so focused on, yeah. on ball mm-hmm. and the guys. And then you get to the off season, you start to realize like your work has just begun. I mean, yeah. th- th- this landscape is stadium's not going to pay for itself. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, and in in a new world of nil, and I mean, there's mm-hmm. just so much going on in college football right now. And uh, I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, I, I, I have certain strengths that I think bode well for being a really effective head coach leader. Yep. Um, but I also have limitations when it comes to, you know, thank God for Alex Nisley and others on our staff in terms of just really getting some schedules hammered out and, and, and forward thinking, not, not, not just for the next six months, the next 12, but we're talking the next 24 months in terms of what we're, what we're planning. Um, you're probably already looking at 2026 recruits and everything, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's wild. Yeah. What do you make of this new – you're a Midwest guy. You're, you and I are about the same age. I hate college football expansion. I hate the, the, the I hate that it's not going to be October, gray skies, misty, gross weather, 30 punts in a game. That's what That, to me, is Big Ten and Big Ten West football. Mm-hmm. How – what do you, how do you feel about this league growing and bringing in these premier programs, Washington, Oregon, 
SC, UCLA. What's how do, and then how do you prepare and how do you like talk to your team about it? Cause like, Hey, like life's going to be different. Travel's going to be different. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it makes sense for football and, and I'm not saying it's, it's common sense or necessarily logical, but in terms of the TV Dollars contracts and, and, yeah. and, 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 and position, like it makes sense where it makes no sense to me is, you know, why, why this is affecting all other sports to, 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 to me, Amen. you know, I, I just, I, I look forward to people getting at, at, at the table and continue to find creative ways to come up with solutions to make this better for all student athletes, mm-hmm. not just being concerned with, you know, the revenue, the yeah. revenue yeah. in football. But, you know, the, the thing we get excited about is, you know, what the, the brand of football that you at USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington play obviously is, uh, you know, it, the, the landscape's changing. Mm-hmm. Do you think that changes the way that you recruit or where you recruit? Yeah, that uh, that was my follow-up. You know, you, to be honest with you, I think you double down on uh, recruiting high-character young men that are tough, that love football, that value Northwestern education. The only way that we're going to be able to consistently compete with these guys in this landscape is finding guys that truly want to be at Northwestern for four years, understand the value of the, the degree. Mm-hmm. Now, they can understand the value of their degree, but we want guys that love football, that, yeah. that are football motivated, that they're walking the facility saying, I want to become an All-Big Ten player, I want to play in the NFL, and I also understand, regardless of when football ends, this degree will benefit me and my family for the rest of my life. I, I think you double down on those things. you got to be line of scrimmage based. And again, I'm not I'm not trying to throw any shade on, on the you know, athletes that we've had at Northwestern over the years and continue to have. Like we're, we're going to continue to find great wide receivers, great running mm-hmm. backs. The DB tradition at our place has been, been awesome. really, really yep. strong. The whole line is it's unbelievable. Well, yeah. well, well. And, 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 and that that's where I'd go where we need to make – like how do we consistently find a way to beat USC, the U, USC's of the world? We better be line of scrimmage based. And yeah. I know they're saying the same thing, but at the end of the day, we, we, we can consistently find ways to – you know, bringing the right offensive lineman, the right defensive lineman, continue to surround those guys with great, great skill sets and talent. But for us to think that we're going to out air raid USC, like that's just not. We we got to find our formula. Yeah. And our formula uh, formula is going to be playing complementary football, winning at the line of scrimmage. And when we're playing in Evanston in November and throwing the football is not advantageous to winning. When you have to run the football, we better be able to run the football. Mm-hmm. We better be able to get back to yeah. Big Ten West yeah. football and lean 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 into that identity. I love that. Don't make don't don't uh, mold your play style. I'm talking about all you know founding Big Ten West members as a whole. Make them change to us. You know. Yeah, you, I right? want I want UCLA coming in and seeing Northwestern on the schedule. Not that I really care about you guys, full disclosure. <laughs> but <laughs> I want them seeing that on the schedule. You know, like it's Monday and they're like, "Fuck!" <laughs> like we got to go because you know it's going to be a three hour war, and and a rock fight. And, yeah, and, and, and that's when Northwestern's at their best all the time when it's a rock fight. I, 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 I basketball too, no doubt. No, I mean, watching those guys battle throughout the season with the injuries that, mm-hmm. I mean, what Chris Collins, that staff, Boo, that group of guys did this year, you, you know, I'm so proud to bring bring my kids, bring my boys around our football team just because of what our guys stand for and the way that they work. And I, I was just as proud to bring my boys to countless basketball games this year for our boys. I mean, the, the, the way mm-hmm. Lucas and Andrew Braun watching that basketball team and the way that Chris Collins has that group playing – I mean, gosh, naturally a fan because I'm affiliated with Northwestern. Yep. But I mean, those guys are impossible not to be endeared to and just want to be loved a part them. of. One of my last two years, two of my favorite teams I've ever rooted for across all sports, and I'm not even a basketball uh, guy really. No, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah. I mean, and and we were we were fortunate. It was over spring break. We surprised our boys and went to the tournament games. That's and, awesome. I mean, it, yeah. what what an experience. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. Um, so a few minutes ago, you said that you're fully handing the keys to Coach McGarrigle on the defense. On the flip side, you guys did have... you say that? No, I, absolutely. Okay, yeah, right. absolutely. Right. It, it's his defense, in spite of you being the you know previous named defensive coordinator now, Hawkeye. But on the flip side, you guys got a little baby on the offensive side of the ball, a guy who's you know what, 27 or 28. He's young. He's a kid. Yep. I can you imagine being a, a offensive coordinator in the Big Ten at that age? I can't imagine it now. No, <laughs> like uh, the maturity level he's got to have, and and the brains he's got to have, and the and everything going on between it. Like he is, that's impressive. So what led you? Obviously, his success at I'm always mixing North, at South Dakota, 
beat you guys in the championship. Sorry mm. about that. Yeah, um, that was a rough day. <laughs> was he an immediate target for you guys? Like, that's our guy, let's go get him? Or was it, you know, kind of like widespread search or what was it? Yeah, you know, I, I knew that was going to be uh, a critical hire for so many reasons. Um, I don't think it really was. Well, you know, it, 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 it was something that, uh, to be honest with you, Zach's name came up in my mind. Um, others had brought his name mm -hmm. to me, but I initially had a lot of resistance, you know, and, and again, that was just natural from the North Dakota state, South Dakota state rivalry. Okay. You know, yeah. I yeah. like that though. No, I mean, it was oh, like this guy. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and it was like, we love hating people. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. one of my favorite yeah. things on earth. And, yeah. and to be honest with you, the, I mean, the, the saying around our household was the stinking jackrabbits. I mean, yeah. from, 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 from our children, like, mm -hmm. and literally when we hired Christian Smith last year as our defensive line coach and our boys found out, I mean, they, they were pissed. They were like, <laughs> how old are your boys? They're, they're, uh, Lucas turns is about to turn nine, but they're seven and eight right okay. now. Okay. Awesome. And, yeah. and they, I mean, they are Northwestern through and through. Uh, but there is a certain level of buys and blood that will never come yeah. out of their yeah, veins. Yeah. I mean, and, and they were they were literally pissed at that. Like, Dad, we hired someone from the Jackrabbits. Like, what what is wrong with yeah. you? How could you allow this to happen? And uh, you know, as as we navigated the process, the first time I talked with Zach, I was like, man, I, I really hope I don't like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, so I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. And and then and then we dive into the conversation. I was like, get off the phone. I was like, yeah, God damn it, I kind of like that guy. Uh, and yeah. then and then you dive into ball and understand. It really challenged and charged him with making sure that the system and the concepts that he was able to bring to the table could fit different fittings of personnel from a standpoint. Yeah, you ran, ran ran the crap out of the football at South Dakota State, mm -hmm. and you got these incredible tight ends, and you know Mark right. Nelson, NFL guys. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. absolutely. But hey, you know you may be walking in a situation where we got a developing offensive line. You got AJ Henning and Bryce Kurtz and Caleb Kamalafa and Joe Hyman and some of these. Like you, Zach, you're gonna have to demonstrate to me that you can you can mold this to the personnel that we have on this team. And as 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 the offense continues to evolve over the years, that can continue to evolve. And I was just blown away with just his his understanding of the game, his understanding of leverage, his understanding of defense, his ability to teach and communicate well, uh, his ability to lead. You know, at the end of the day, you're you're, you're charged with leading and managing an offensive staff. And um, you know, I I feel really uh, confident that we've we've built in the other pieces around him. You know. Chris Foster and Armand Bins that were with us last year doing an exceptional job. You know, there's some things that we were doing last year that our guys really liked that were really effective that we're gonna, you know, mold into the new mm -hmm. offense because they 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 fit it and and our guys experience a lot of success with it. Bill O'Boyle, our line coach, I've known Bill for, I mean, since I was twenty three year old three years old as a GA. He's coached at the lower levels, but the ultimate developer of fundamentals and technique is just a really good fit for what that room needs right now. And shoot, Paul Creighton and I are on the phone, you know, finalizing, you know, him coming to Northwestern and that dude's prepping to, to coach in a national championship game against Michigan, the value he brings on special teams, but also on offense. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that group. But Zach, I mean, the amount of times I've had people walk away from recruiting opportunities or even high school coaches around our building from their interactions with Zach, like, man, that guy's impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, been a, been a great hire. No. And, uh, yeah, and uh, you guys also highlighted uh, Harlan Barnett of MSU. Was that, um, I don't want to say a way to hedge your inexperience, but was it a way to hedge your inexperience as a head coach? Because he's been around the block and is super respected, at he, least from what I know in, in football circles. We, we definitely, you know, Bill O'Boyle's been a head coach prior, um, mm -hmm. but most of his experience was at, was at lower levels. Uh, you know, de certainly lean on Bill, but I, I really was trying to be intentional about finding someone that, um, you know, had experience in the Big Ten mm -hmm. and uh, that had some level of head coaching experience. And Harlan's was only last year in a very difficult situation, but in that short time as a yeah. head coach was navigating some of the craziest stuff yep. you could imagine. And uh, he's just been such a, such a calming influence. Uh, you know, he just really, really, really in tune on the recruiting trail. Uh, we'll, we'll just subtly bring me some ideas. Hey, under Coach Dan Antonio, this is how we operated out two minutes. Here's how we handled some of these things. I mean, just a wealth of knowledge. Yep. 
And he's someone that aspires to get another opportunity to become a head coach mm-hmm. long term. And you want guys on your staff that aspire to be head coaches because they view every decision that's made through a head coaching lens and can be the guys that can really grab you and be like, hey, Dave, this might be something you want to rethink. And, yep. and to be be honest with you, I, I did not know Harlan at all before this process. Had someone come to me with his name, my initial reaction was like, there's no way he's interested. And they're like, Dave, you need to talk to him. We, we start talking before you know it. He's down in Evanston. He's interviewing. I, I mean, feel so fortunate that we were able to bring him in. Him and his wife, Tammy, are just, I mean, this recruiting weekend that we had this past weekend, so positive. And, and, and Harlan Barnett was a huge part in that. You came from a level where they had this, you know, ex- expanded playoff pool. And I'm wondering, where do you see with all the changes where Northwestern, like what what is a great season for Northwestern? Is it being in the playoff? Because historically it's like, hey, Northwestern wins nine games. You get to the Big Ten championship because you won the West. What a year. Now, like the landscape changes. It feels like it's going to be very difficult to get into that I'll game. Even- so it is is – the playoff, the goal now is that like, hey, like we're marching towards being one of those twelve teams. A- absolutely. Okay. And in twenty twenty, Northwestern finished tenth in the country. That's, so yep. it, it's like, it, it it can happen. And again, being in the Big Ten, I think really positions us the right mm-hmm. way. I mean, uh, the the reality is right now, if you want to play at the highest level of college football, you want to be playing in the Big Ten or the SEC. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, the, so 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 to be positioned in the Big Ten is is huge and. You know, I, I hope this does not come across as as overconfident or cocky, but I've been bold with, with our team and with our recruits. The goal is to still win a Big Ten championship. Now, how do we do that? It's not by conforming. It's not trying to out Ohio State, Ohio mm-hmm. State, or out Michigan, Michigan. Like, the only way we have an opportunity to do that is by being the best developmental program in the country and out teaming people. And in a world where this college football has become so much more about, you know, it's become more transactional, it's become more transient, you know, portal guys in and out, you know, guys disgruntled about, if we can continue to create create an environment where we continue to find creative ways to to support our guys more than we ever have before in this new environment, which we which we certainly want to do, while keeping the integrity of the ultimate team, I I, I boldly will say that we, we we can find a way to win a Big Ten championship. Yeah. It's just not going to look like it may look like at other places. Do you think double repping helps with that? Because, Absolutely, because guys feel like they they're getting reps. They feel like they have a chance to move up. Like you, I can't remember the guy you just mentioned at the beginning of the interview, Michael Kilbane. Yeah, yeah. So is that like, hey, like, yeah, you're you're on this, you're on field B or whatever you call it now. But look at him, like he started field B and now he's up. And is that something that you got? Is that was that one of the motivations for doing that? Heck yeah, you know. Okay. And and, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of tangible examples. North Dakota State won a national championship, I believe, in 2016. Carson Wentz, I mean, electric, yeah. first-round draft pick. Well, he breaks his hand, breaks his wrist like week seven. Easton Stick comes in, wins every single game moving forward mm-hmm. uh, for North Dakota State before Carson comes back from the national championship game. Easton, still playing in the NFL, will boldly tell you there's no way he's prepared for that opportunity if it wasn't for double reps because since the day he stepped on campus, yeah. he wasn't the fourth-string quarterback getting three reps a day. He was on the out. twos field yeah. learning the offense, getting 30 reps a day. Uh, Cordell Volson, starting right guard for the Cincinnati Bengals. You go back and watch Cordell's freshman and sophomore like, practice tape on the twos field, you're like, oh, my gosh. Yeesh. Yeah. I mean, turns into one of the best def- best offensive linemen to ever play FCS football, and now he's starting the NFL. But it it required hands on development where guys are are doing and learning and failing along through the process. Um, it, we're we're definitely going to lean into that. Now, is that not common in in college football? You know, the, give all the starters the. Uh, should we cut this out so we don't give away? Yeah, I don't want to give away state secrets. <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's it's in a lot of ways it's the old Nebraska model. Now, okay. now Nebraska used to have like I don't uh, know Tom I, Osborne. Yeah, yeah okay. I mean, I don't know how many they had on the roster, but it was countless. Yeah, and I mean, they, they, more than hundred. It was like quadruple reps. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. was reps going on all over the place, and that's really where Craig Bull you know, who came from Nebraska, had a Nebraska roots and he got to North Dakota State back in 2007 or whatever it was, brought it to NDSU. Um, you know, it, it's something you got to be mindful of. You want to make sure that the double repping doesn't all of a sudden 
overtax some of your guys that are fifth year guys that you know you need to scale back. You need to be yeah. strategic with it, mm-hmm. but the non-negotiables, we got to find ways to develop our entire roster every single day so that when things do happen, it's time for that next man up. That young man has a certain level of confidence that yeah. he's ready to step in. I just feel like if you're a player, you just got to keep your that, that keeps your morale high. Yeah, I feel like you're, you're yeah you're not I going feel like there you, for no reason. This is just purely speculative, but I feel like you'd be less likely to be in the transfer portal if you're practicing and getting you know playing every day and you know getting your reps. No, I mean the, the the ways the ways that we can combat the transfer portal at Northwestern are by finding every single way we possibly can to support these guys. Put them in a situation where they feel like they're growing and developing and improving. Because the the fact that matters when you transfer, you are stunting your growth in mm-hmm. some way, shape, or form. You're stunting yeah, your true. growth and your progression. Starting uh, from the bottom and, and and finding every way to support these guys that 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 we can to make sure that we retain our student athletes. And part of that at Northwestern, hopefully, is the experience that they're they're having within our program. Uh, and the other piece of that is again, it comes back to our recruiting, making sure we're recruiting young men that value what's on the back end of this experience. It's it's being developed holistically as a football player and as a man, and also understanding that the degree and the network that you walk away from at Northwestern, that Riley's so involved with mm-hmm. us right now, like, you know, there's not a single guy in our class of 2025. There won't be a single guy in our class of 2025 that has any understanding of what NIL they'll, they'll come in with or what they'll receive. Because guys, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a $360,000 education that, that, yeah. that that's being paid for on top of an opportunity when in, when you earn that degree from Northwestern, the value that that brings you. Now we're talking millions. Yeah. And the, the, again, the way that we're going to find a way to be successful in this space is not by conforming. We, we, we got to double down on who we are and find our subtle niches that, that, that play well in, in the recruiting space. In this entire landscape, the thing that we're not that we're not talking about is graduation rate. Like we, yeah. we talk, like the transfer portal also now has this like kind of like oh I'm going in the transfer portal. Like it's 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 almost like something that has this allure and it's cool. And, you it's know, got a cool yeah. name. Yeah, it, it, no, it, it, cool. it, it, yeah. it does. And now we're talking oh, about the, the best available yeah, in the yeah. portal and yeah. all. Yeah. Like Mel Kiper. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and my my frustration with that is is I've been places where you know over half of our team is first generation college students. And the, and the only reason that some of these young men decided to go to a four-year institution is because they wanted to play football. And then all of a sudden, what that degree can do for that young man and his future and his family. It changes generations. It, it, it does. Yeah. And, and, and that, that, that happens maybe not as much at Northwestern, but we, we got some first-generation college yeah. students on our team. But what's going on with all this is the, the stories that aren't being talked about is that junior at XYZ University – that decides to transfer for X amount of dollars, which in the short term is a lot of money, but in the long term is really nothing. Yeah. You know, it's going to get yeah. spent over. changing. The, yeah. And no. Spend it on a car or something. And then, yeah. then, then I lose 24 credits in that transfer, and now my eligibility is up, and it's time to declare, declare for the draft. And I last for 14 days of camp, get cut, don't get re-picked up, and now I'm sitting here going, what do I do now? And I don't have my degree. Like, yeah. that's what we're not talking about. Th- those are the unforeseen consequences that no one's talking about. I don't want that to be, to be the story for Northwestern. Mm-hmm. I, I want the story to be, man, these guys are having such an incredible experience. They're being developed. They're having an opportunity. We're finding, you know, Jacob's finding opportunities to continue to support these guys so that they stay at Northwestern and the non-negotiable is they leave with their degree. And then the challenge for us as a coaching staff is, okay, how do we make sure they leave with their degree in a Big Ten championship? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I know there's going to be people that that roll their eyes at me. I get it. Like, I, I, I understand I'm not, first of all. Well, no, he, I, he may be. I'm not. Him and I have had this argument for a legit decade. P- people audibly laughed when I told them about what goals we had for ourselves this fall when I was at Big Ten Media Day. And I didn't blame them one bit. I, yeah. I, I think Northwestern's at its best when it's a little edgy and got a chip on our shoulder. So let, 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 let's let's keep it up. Um, have, have I coached against Ohio State or Michigan yet? No, I haven't. Do I understand how damn good this league is? I do. I, I, I know the tax, task that's in front of us, but the the way that we do that at Northwestern is by not chasing a bunch of portal guys, building a team that is when they, regardless if it's week two or week eleven or week fourteen in the playoff, is going to show up and battle their ass off for one another. Now I I'm gonna I had a question that I it was pre written out that kind of goes off of that, but I'm gonna make an assumption that I already know the answer. 
based off of the rest of the interview so far, have you had any like talks with admissions about lowering standards at all? Uh, to get in, you know, we're, we're all give our university a lot of credit. They, they, there's there's been ongoing conversations. Do those happen directly with me? No, they don't. Um, but there there is definitely a willingness within the university to have some really good open communication on what this new landscape of college football looks like, and how Northwestern is going to have to have a certain level of willingness to to just say how do we operate in this mm-hmm. space and. Uh, you know, has, has there been dramatic movement on that? No, but I, I am, I'm really proud of the fact that there's been a willingness to, to enter into that conversation. It's just a conversation that needs to continue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I asked that because, I mean, Fitz was like the, he was Northwestern. He mm-hmm. was, he was, you know, famous alumni, famous head coach, you know, brought them from the dark ages, not technically with coach Barnett, but you know, he had them on a, on a good path for yes. a long time. And it seemed like he didn't get any budget. I'm like, ah, I don't even think he, like coach Braun would have the ability to walk up to them and be like, Hey, we need to change this. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I, I think of Northwestern, I do think that they can, and I say they, you can be a potential big 10 champion, like perennially. Not, I'm not saying like Ohio State. I'm, I'm saying that Northwestern in the mix, yeah, can absolutely be in the mix year over year, and you don't have to have those three and nine seasons. Obviously, you know, it's gonna happen, but you don't have to. And I guess what my my one of my final questions is like, how do you take it from the the level that Fitz built and just really put it over the top? Yeah, you know, it's a, that's that's a great question. The, the the first thing that I want to say to that is I, I have an incredible amount of like reverence to what what Fitz accomplished, mm-hmm. what Coach Walk accomplished, what Gary Barnett accomplished. I mean, I I, I remember vividly watching that Notre Dame Northwestern mm-hmm. game in '96 as a kid, Same. like vividly. You know, I mean, it was. I mean, my dad said, "I hated like, it." Like, what is going on? <laughs> what the? You yeah. know? And then they lost my yeah. Ohio next week. Ugh. Yeah. You know what? It, Trap game. Yeah. It, Trap, it, talk, 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 yeah. Talk, talk about the highs <laughs> yeah. and lows. Right. But, uh, my gosh. Uh, and shoot, we opened with Miami, Ohio. What Chuck Martin's done? We got, we got, yep. we got our hands full week one. But uh, what, what I will say is, um, the, 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 the way that that we continue to move forward, this to me is, I, I think when there's transition at the head coaching position, it does provide an opportunity to step back and say, okay. What has been built? There's so many things about it that that were right, and so many things mm-hmm. that are really impressive. But is that best for us moving forward? And really evaluating all those avenues, and just ensuring that, again, it it can't be about the quick fix at Northwestern. The quick fix at Northwestern yeah. doesn't work. It's about what's sustainable, and what our guys are doing in terms of their development while they're here. And part of that is making sure that you're recruiting the right young men. Not, not guys that are coming just for the degree, guys that are coming to have support and becoming the best football player that they can be and understand what the degree will do for them in the long run. Um, and, and then we, we, better, we better find ways to continue to be you know, at the forefront in, from a scheme standpoint in complementary football where we really put people on edge. And, and I'll, I'll just go back. I don't know if it was under Coach Walk or Coach Fitz. I, I, I don't recall, but – you know, some of this tempo offense that we see in, in, in college football right now, Northwestern was one it of the started first. It. To, yeah. Yeah, it started it. You know, yeah. but, but, but it was it was going against the grain. Now, if you just come out and like, oh, we're going to be tempo, we're going to be tempo, we're going to throw. Everyone else. Everyone else is doing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. We have to find the things that go back into the grain at Northwestern. And we got to be willing to constantly evolve in that space. Because if we just want to continue to conform, or not continue, but if the choice is to conform, that, that 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 that's not how we consistently win in the Big Ten. We we have to be ahead of it. We have to go against the grain, and we have to find ways to have all three phases in sync and not be playing Wishbone for stance. Coming back, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, but here's just something that popped in my head. I I hate analytics in sports at this point. We're not math guys. You guys have access to some brilliant students. I would assume. Do you guys tap into that at all? Be like, hey, like you're a math nerd who probably doesn't even know what a pigskin is, but like tell us to make this offense more efficient and how to do it. You know, we, we do tap into analytics, um, you know, and, and to be honest with you, just speaking very transparently, I'm still super skeptical in terms of, you know, how how we use those analytics. Yeah. 
Um, I, I do think we have incredible resources on campus and, and there's room for more continued growth with getting our students involved uh, if there's an appetite for it. And where I, th where I think there's a space that's untapped right now, and you know, I had a conversation with, with someone about this the other day and, and they brought it up to me and it just, I'm appreciative that they did because I agree. It, it's really in, in, in our recruiting space. Is there things that we can tap into in our recruiting space when it comes to not only you know, size and length and growth potential and 40 time and what a broad jump really means to someone's explosiveness. But it's also, you know, we naturally have a tendency to recruit somewhat nationally, not the entire country, but nationally just with our academic profile, which is great, but that can lead to a ton of inefficiencies in terms of our travel. We need to really dive into like some of the areas that have consistently been successful for Northwestern and really making sure that our resources are intentional and direct and we're getting return on that investment in terms of recruiting um ai recruiting it, it, well <laughs> you know it, it, don't talk to me about it it's someone way smarter than me yeah but the, the, the thing i struggle with i think analytics are a great thing to look at on the front end to collect information but in game decisions there's so much context to every decision yeah. You know that 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 book was was made for first quarter when we were expecting dry conditions, but it's the third quarter and now it's been raining for the last thirty minutes and the mm -hmm. ball's wet. And your right guard, you know, went down with an injury. And now you got a true freshman that's that, that yeah. that's playing at that position. And you know what? As much as we didn't expect to be able to, there's just so many things that are that are moving throughout the game that. Um, I'm excited to find ways that we can leverage some of that information to our advantage. I just need to continue to better understand it because I personally feel like sometimes I watch games, I'm like, man, you're, you're making a decision just based on the book. There's so yeah. much other context here that needs to be factored into your decision making. But maybe that's just a guy that only took one math class in college <laughs> talking. So. All right. Here's another point of contention for Dave and I regarding Northwestern. When I look at the blue bloods of college football, Alabama, USC, Notre Dame, Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State – they have a uniform that they wear basically every week. It is iconic. It is unchanging. And then you have these other programs are all chasing to be Oregon. I feel like Northwestern has gone down that road where you have that N, the purple, like those, the mid nineties uniforms I thought were awesome. Is there any, are you involved in the branding and the uniforms or anything like that? Where we're like, we're going to change things a little bit. Like this is who we are. It's purple and black every week and none of this extra foo foo stuff. Yeah. No candy ass uniforms. <laughs> uh, you know what? That that is something I have not invested in. Think about time it. In. Get the so, AI on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh now, now you got me thinking. Okay. Now All right. You got me thinking. Dave likes the foo foo uniforms. <laughs> I I think if people are talking about you, then it's a good thing. I, especially I, like if you're wearing the foo foo uniforms, especially when you're having a good season, it just it's 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 free press. The, the the gothics are incredible. I love those gothics. Yeah. The gothics across are across all the northwestern sports. They're amazing. Um, a couple of the throwbacks. I don't know if you were like you would even remember this, but back in like I don't know twenty. Riley might have been there twenty eighteen or so. They had like a American flag throwback. Yep. Do you remember the what happened with that? No. Well. It was it, it was like paint splatter and it looked like blood on the flag and everyone everyone started freaking out like oh my god how could they desecrate the flag like that and like, hey it's just a uniform guys so like chill out but um but I appreciate you hopping on the show um I, I'll I'll finish by saying this and then you can say whatever you want I got either of you guys or Riley but um I can't believe that you guys. Now, now I can obviously, but like after everything that happened last summer, I was like, "This is a dead program." Like David Braun, I don't know if he like a high school Who coach at Lincoln guy? Way East or Glenford <laughs> West or 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 any of the other high school blue bloods, Wheat Mournville South, uh, Libertyville. Uh, know who this guy is? How is he gonna you know put his recruiting flag here? Like this is a dead program. The Ryan's aren't gonna build this stadium. Now we're sitting here and it is. All it's all systems go. Uh, thank you for that. It's you guys and and the basketball program have been the only two teams that, and I guess the Bears a little bit right now. We'll see still, but have given me any joy the last few years. So thank you. Keep that going. Keep we it going. Appreciate you. Dave. And anything I can do to help, get eyeballs on that program. You know, get if you want to get all the recruits in the world in this office. I 
give you all the permission in the world. I haven't asked any of my bosses for permission. Dave has no integrity. So if you need him to drop a bag somewhere. Yeah. Do it for yeah. I, that's, that's what I'm getting at right there. <laughs> you, you know, at, 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 at number one, thank you. And, and, and number two, you know, it's, I gotta be honest with you, Dave. It's 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 guys like like you and and others that I've had a chance to spend so much time with that get me so motivated in terms of what we're doing. He's gonna give you his number. <laughs> He's <laughs> you're I, all right. You're, I, I, I I I want this guy front and center cheering his tail off. You'll be rolling with yeah. the Braun boys. Hell I mean, they, yeah. They, they, yeah! Oh yeah! Uh, they, let's they, keep them separate. <laughs> yeah, maybe they'll have, nine years from now. Sure, they'll well, have nicotine yeah. in, by the in the by the third quarter yeah so they're a little young Nicotine for that addiction yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's probably yeah give him a few wait till he get to high school um but yeah i i i'm i can't wait for games this fall at the at the lakeville yeah. stadium it's gonna be it's gonna be so fun be cool I, i'm just so excited for our for our students to engage you know yep. and, and hopefully you know these next two years that that's just becomes what our students do on Saturdays in the fall, and it's what our students do for Welsh Ryan and the environment that was created, and that carries over into Ryan Field. And um, that it, basketball good. stadium is so loud; it's it awesome, is so loud. And and I've seen the renderings. I love a stadium rendering with the, like you said, the it's got like the European soccer for sure. Vibe. Yeah, that's exactly it. And uh, it's going to be loud, and I can't wait. It's it's obviously it's unavoidable at North. Like Ryan Field is almost fifty thousand people, and when your student body is only 8,000, not all of them, most of them don't care about sports. A lot of them, international students, don't even know what football is really. It's hard to get a, a vibrant, rambunctious student yeah. section. When you dumb that down to 35 or whatever the new stadium is going to be with an enclosed roof, everybody wearing purple, you see like there's not a lot of Northwestern fans out there, but we can be loud and 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 really give a good home court advantage, home field advantage when when we're able to, you know. So I'm excited for that. We are too. We are too. Thanks for having me on. Guys. Yeah, this, thank this thank you. For yeah, it was great us. to meet yeah. you. And, great um, to meet you. Yeah, uh, hopefully uh, we make this yearly thing. You don't get plucked off by you know a, a larger program. Hopefully you're a, yeah, you're a, our yeah, lifer. In his eyes. Well, you know the <laughs> you know it's 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 one of those things when when Chris and I came here. You know I told you earlier, it, dream job, stability. Yeah, dream, dream job, and uh, you know. If you would have told me at any point in my career, at any point in my career, I was going to have an opportunity to be the head coach at Northwestern, I would, I would have, I would have told you BS. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still feel like, in a lot of ways, we're, you know, li li living a dream right now. Um, that that started with a nightmare, to be honest with yeah. you. It, yeah. And uh, you know, again, in in the world of college football right now, the last thing you want to be is a program that doesn't know its identity. Mm -hmm. You know. Ohio State knows who they are. Yep. Michigan knows who they are. Northwestern, we know who we are. We don't need to go conform. Right. But but some of these schools that are kind of, who are we? Yeah. And so and Michigan lost their way. They had to, they had for, to, for rich rod years. Like, right. That wasn't like, no Michigan. Doubt. Right. Yeah. So you have yeah. to have like they needed Harbaugh to come be like, no, this is what Michigan football is. Absolutely. And like it sounds like you have, like you're continuing on. You know what Northwestern is, and you're going to make it your own as well. And I don't know. I've been very impressed uh, with you in this interview. So thanks for coming in. I know you might be doing the yak challenge or something else. So we'll get we'll get <laughs> you out of here. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, Coach. It was great, and we'll be rooting for you. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks to Coach Braun, Big Beard Guy, White Sox Dave, Beard Guy, Eddie Beard Guy. You can be a Beard Guy too. Uh, the hair on your face is different from the hair on your body. You need specific products. Uh, beard Guys has products that wash, hydrate, and help style your beard. Start your day off right with a two-in-one special wash and tame, a wash and conditioner combo that is meant to cleanse and condition your beard. It's got this great, great citrus scent. Uh, so hydrate that beard with some oil. The beard oil helps soften and moisturize the beard. It's summer. It's smooching season. You're going to want to have that soft beard and skin. Uh, lock in the beard and style it with the, some matte styling clay. This product has... Uh, Kaolin clay to help keep your beard in place and can be used on your hair as well. I use it on my hair. I want that citrus smell. Whether you're a seasoned vet or a rookie beginning your, the bearded journey, Beard Guys is the brand for your beard. You can find Beard Guys at your Walmart or Walgreens. Everyone's got access to one of those. So check them out. Uh, beard Guys, can't recommend them enough. Now I apologize for all the jumping around in seats in this YouTube and Rumble video. However, we are cutting this up at different times, but I had never met David Braun before. I didn't know a whole lot about him. I just had seen what I like different interviews and he struck me as very fits like, which I didn't know if that was intentional or not. 
but we got ourselves a football coach. Yeah, and they really lucked into him. Yeah, they I'm a really neutral. He he's my kind of guy. Loved him. Great great little football chat. It's not really football season though. It is baseball season. We got to talk some Cubs. They're sputtering a little bit. We went to the bullpen. We got Michael Cerami from uh, Bleacher Nation. We're gonna kick it to him now. David. Yeah, let's just kick it to him now. Do it. Whoosh. All right. Uh, we're back. Another interview. Loaded show today. We brought in some reinforcements to talk Cubs. Nobody's here. It's a friend of the program, Michael Cerami, Bleacher Nation. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. Happy to talk Cubs. Are you? Because I feel no. like things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Things are things are dire. You got shut out two games in a row. What, what is going on with this team? I felt like we got through April. Everybody kind of exhaled a little bit because it was such a murderer's row kind of schedule. West Coast swing, all that. Every Vibes were high, on pace for 97 wins, and it feels like we've come back down earth a little bit. And it, now it's, to me, with Bellinger back, it's starting to feel like maybe it's a little bit more than just injuries. What do you chalk up this this lack of offense here the last few weeks to? I mean, the last few weeks is one thing. We haven't been back with Belly and yeah. Sega that long, right? right? And so when you go to Atlanta – and you face that team, it's like, yeah, they're going to make a lot of teams look bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Cubs, I, I've seen a couple of like, you know, comments on Twitter and stuff, people being like, yo, you know, as soon as the Cubs face a good team, they fall apart. It's like, I don't think that that's quite fair. I mean, they played well against the Dodgers. I mean, the Astros aren't the Astros this year, but they yeah handled them, they swept them. They faced the Padres and have done all right. Um, they, they beat the Brewers in two out of three, like, they're, it's just the Braves are the best team in baseball, arguably. And mm -hmm. we're playing at their park without, uh, you know, our full lineup healthy. Swanson's out. Nico didn't play. Yeah. Um, our bullpen is not just a mess. All of the best pitchers are hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jamison Tyon came back and, you know, he's was pitching well, but he also was pushed back his start for like 10 days while he dealt with a back issue and you know there was an error and a wild pitch in the inning that gave up a bunch of runs it's like i don't know man i'm it's just baseball. i don't sweat losing to the braves that much um it just doesn't it just doesn't really give me that much of a concern my concern is nico horner being healthy and not actually having a hamstring issue dansby swanson getting back uh, chris morell stop you know dinging himself every other game with something um, you know, getting Jordan Wicks back, getting Julian Merriweather back, getting Everett Helsley back. I mean, there's we pretend like the injuries got better because Saya and Cody came back, but there's mm -hmm. still a ton of guys hurt. Yeah. Um. So they're fine. I mean, I'm 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 at a place that I haven't been with the Cubs in a long time, where I'm like, you know, a loss like this, even getting swept, it would suck. Um. But it would. It just doesn't doesn't make me nervous about what's to come. I don't, I don't think it means really much of anything. I think they're going to heal up, continue to play well, and then add at the deadline. And I think this is a playoff team, like no question about it. What's the number one thing they need to add then? Because everyone, I mean, everybody's closer. saying closer. It's, it's a closer. All right. I mean, it, it it is. You know, the offense. Listen, it's been not great, but when they're at full strength, I think it's a pretty tight group. Um, and and this is like without there's this this tiny advantage that we haven't even like gotten into which is like at some point um depending on how what happens with mike talking and ian Happ, basically like pico armstrong should probably be playing center field and bellinger maybe a little bit more first base um you can't sit talking right now so he's either going to play left or, or dh and it just kind of depends on what's going on with him and Happ at any one time but not only like PCA needs to be like a 90 OPS plus player to be like a four win player mm -hmm. on the year because his defense is so good. And I was just talking uh, about this. I'm gonna write an article. I haven't I haven't like solidified the point yet. But well, you know, sound, it out, been... sound it out here. Sound it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you guys have been watching the games like when PCA is in center. How many times do you see him behind the left or right fielder who make the catch just like standing there? It happens all the time yeah. because he. His range is so insane. So a lot of the time, I feel like we talk about his defensive value, about like what he can do, but what the Cubs haven't done yet and they won't be able to do until it's like a, he's the everyday center fielder is 
uh, push the left and right fielder out towards the lines more because PCA's zone of influence is way bigger than even Bellinger's. Mm -hmm. So you can improve the entire product of the defense, not just in center field as a one-to-one by starting them every day. And the Cubs haven't done that yet. And I think at some point they probably will. Um, if he's going to be like a guy that lives in that 90 to 100 OPS plus, right, runs for the plus range, which I think is doable. He's looked pretty good. Um, but until that happens, you know, and until everyone heals up, it's just like it's hard to hard to criticize them when they're playing without Nico and yeah. and Swanson. And Morel's like his he fouled it off his foot. He had like a hurt finger earlier in the year. Um, he hurt. He banged his knee when he – was on a play at third base like a couple weeks ago. I mean, I don't know. I, I think they're going to be all right, frankly. All right. I mean, that, that makes me feel a little bit better because it's it's it does feel like they were – like the vibes aren't as high as they were at the end of April and they're kind of sputtering along. I think, you know, you start seeing – April's a pretty good sample size. And it's like, well, is this team going to be a team that pushes for 95 wins or are we going to be back where the projections were – uh, b- before the season, and it's like I I was starting to get my hopes up quite a bit. Yeah, quite a no, bit. No, I mean, I, I think I think this is a big. Th- I mean, I wrote this before the year for sure. The Cubs' schedule in April, May, and June is way harder than their schedule in July, August, September. Mm-hmm. It's it's like night and day. Um, so hanging if you're if they're above five hundred, um, through the end of May. We're, they're sitting pretty. I mean, like, yeah. it's it's fine. Um, and we have barely played the NL Central. Um, it's just starting to, to happen. So th- there's a lot going on there, too. But, um, you know, we've been playing the AL and NL East and the NL West all year. So, like, it's yeah. it's not it, – it's, it's, it's going to get better. And before the season, we said, like, hanging just at or above 500 through the first two and a half months is, like, more than enough. Um, it's just not – it's a very different schedule than we're used to because they've only had this balanced schedule for a couple of years now. Like, it's – it's yeah. and the balance is playing everybody more often. And we didn't – we haven't even played the Cardinals. Yeah, you let's know, go like, back to the old schedule. It would be a lot – Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cherry picking off of dog shit and all central bums. Yeah, that would be great. That would be awesome. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Are you afraid of Milwaukee as a Cubs fan? This exact version of the Milwaukee Brewers, I should say. Obviously, the Milwaukee Brewers. Been, yeah, yeah. It's the 2024 Brewers. I have no fucking idea. <laughs> it's it's Perfect so answer. I'm so over it. I'm so over the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, we took Craig Council. They lost Josh Hader. Uh, like, what the hell is going on? How? Go I'm away. I'm trying my best not Go to away. scoreboard. Yeah. Like watch in in April and May, but every I'm like, damn, Cubs went like 8 and 2 over the last time. I mean, look, Brewers 9 and 1. What? Yep. Like, what? Yeah. Like, They're little gnats, I feel like. Yeah. And, you know, like this is not even it's not even the last couple years. It's like since 2007, they have been this incredibly frustrating team. That is just like constantly in the Cubs business. The way I think a lot of people contextualize the Cardinals as like the, you know, boogeyman of the NL Central. It hasn't been them for a while. It's been the Brewers over and over and over and over with a team that you look at and you're like, well, there's no way this lineup or this what's left of this rotation or this bullpen can be this good. And they just keep winning. And uh, and they lost David Stearns too. like at some point that's got to start catching up to them. Maybe just like the ground, the foundation that those guys have laid, console and Stearns, like for, over the last decade, is still paying off, which makes sense. They haven't been gone that long, but I mean, Jesus, at some point they got to slow down because it is frustrating. Yeah, it's, it, it is infuriating. And then, like you said, like the closer is the biggest issue. And this is a question. Look, at, I, I'm not the, I'm a little bit of a novice baseball guy. My baseball has kind of fallen off. But I look at Ben Brown with the the big curve. A plus fastball. Do you think that there's a scenario when when the staff is fully healthy, uh, the starting staff that is, that they're just like, you know what, man, you're the closer this year. Go out, go out and get us three, four outs at the end of the game, and you know, and he's been great in these like kind of three inning spots where they need him, and that's obviously has value. But to me, it feels like if they want to max out with this team without having to use assets to to shore up the back end of the bullpen. He, he seems like he has the stuff to do it. Would you experiment with that once Wicks and everybody are back? 
Yeah, I mean, abs- absolutely. So first of all, you nailed it. He's got, he's, when the rotation's healthy, you know, I think you got to go steal Shota, Tyon, Saad, and Jordan Wicks. I think everyone just completely sleeps on how good Wicks looked before yep. he got hurt because mm-hmm. the ERA was a little higher, but it, no, he was awesome. Um, way better than than we remembered. Um, when that happens then, so Hendricks, I don't know what you do with him. Not really the point of this conversation right now. It's we'll, circle, we'll circle back to that. Yeah, yeah, because um, that's a whole thing. Um, but then you have Hayden Wesneski to move into the bullpen as sort of the multi-inning weapon mm-hmm. that can that can take those high leverage but multi-inning spots like you did after Shota the other night um, in Atlanta. And so that leaves Brown more open to being like a high leverage guy. Because right now, I think the Cubs kind of still have to use him in that multi-inning role. Um, but eventually, no doubt. And so not only does that he fit, his stuff fits um, and his fastball will probably play up. A two-pitch pitcher as it is makes a lot more sense in the bullpen. Um, anyway, the only question I think will be not if he can handle the moment because I think, although I think it's an important thing, like we've seen guys, it's like the same thing as the leadoff. It's like everyone says they want to be the same person in the ninth inning or the seventh inning, but they're not. Everyone, you know, it, it hits you It's human nature. We'll, yeah, exactly. Well, So mm-hmm. we'll see if that works. But the real question is going to be like, can he go one inning back to back days or three days in a row or, you know, get five outs and then go back out the next night for three outs? Because that hasn't really been what he's built his body up for, at least this right. year. And um, it's not like the same. Like, I know he's stretched out as a starter, so you might think, oh, he could throw a lot of innings. But that's a whole different it's a- it's a animal different animal. Entirely. We were talking about this a little bit the other day. I think that the transition from one to the other should, in theory, be insanely easy because the the muscle memory doesn't change. But going from pitcher to reliever, especially the closer, you're getting that adrenaline dump type mindset, you know? And that's the one thing. Can he hone that? Like, I'm not, right. like, I, I'm not talking about... Um, like necessarily like handling the moment I'm talking about handling the adrenaline where he's going to be trying to throw one or two instead of a hundred, you know, miss a spot six inches on the, like more towards the middle of the plate instead of right on the black. That's what I'd be looking for. Can he do that? But uh, physically that's a young kid we're talking about. He's built like a fucking Paul Bunyan. What is he? Six, yeah. six, five, six, whatever yeah, he's it is. Like six, six. He's a monster of he's a human, a, a little lanky. Sure. But he's a big dude. Give him the ball in the ninth inning. He's gonna be fine. He yes, should be. I, he should be fine. Yeah. He should be fine. Like we, Eddie sent me this this tweet. I don't even know what it was from about how they're gonna start uh, having like workload management in baseball. This is a young kid we're talking about. Give him the ball and go. Let him get the last three outs. Stop. Stop overcomplicating shit. You know they they tend to do that in sports. Throw the dip mm-hmm. in. Go get three outs. That's all you got to do. That's it. You know. It's it's like yeah. I, I I I know it's a cheap and stupid fucking quote, but in the Sandlot when he's like, "Dude, you're thinking too much." Just like it's baseball. I know it's Major League Baseball, but it, that's the rule still applies, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think I think you know the willingness uh, of the Cubs org. Obviously, he's a different manager to just like give as El- Elzali the chance last year, and obviously he did really well last year. Um, shows to me that like they have no qualms with just handing it to right. Brown when the time comes. Like I said though, until Wesneski is like definitely in the bullpen, which right now it's kind of weird mm-hmm. in between time, um, because Kyle Hendricks, you know, I love the guy, but like it was He's cooked. That wasn't a good that wasn't a that wasn't as good of a start. It wasn't he wasn't back. That wasn't announcing he's yeah. back. You know what I mean? Um the box so, score looked well, nice. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you dig in, you're like, ah, uh, okay. I mean, we'll see. I nothing would make me happier. And I mean, I hate I hate when I have to like play both sides because it's like everyone acts like he's been cooked for years when he was awesome last year. Yeah, he, he was, was really good. Yeah. And you, like you can't just be like, Well, those twenty four start starts don't count. It did, do. It, it was, did feel like happened. that came out of nowhere though. Like I yeah, like there was sure. a big surprise. But but not entirely because he spent the whole off season before that uh, velocity training. Mm-hmm. So he had lost his velo down to like 87, 86. And that was everything for him at the time. He trained, started the season late on purpose because he was still ramping up his velocity. Then he came back and 
peeled off 24 good starts. Like it was like a 3.5 ERA or something. Yeah. You take that all day. Um, so I don't know if he's going to get that back. He still has his velocity. He still has his movement. Um, every now and then his location, which has to be perfect, looks like it did at his best. And then he just gets like rocket after rocket. And you're like, Jesus Christ. And like more walks than you're used to seeing and yeah. all that stuff. But I don't know what the Cubs are going to do with him. It's it's anyone that pretends like it's not a tough decision because of who he is. is just like not taking it seriously because yeah, there's still people and it's still an organization. He still means a lot. You know, it's, it's, it's a brutal game and, and they're not going to just like let him get, you know, rocked every five days, but he's going to get another start. Not like it's, a, it's yeah. over, you know? So until we figure that out, until Jordan Wicks comes back, there's not going to be any resolution there. And that means Wesneski might not have a resolution. It means Brown can't be the closer yet, in my opinion. So, so when they are all healthy, and let's hope they're healthy the rest of the way, then what do you do with Kyle? Yeah, I mean, old Yeller. Uh, does he have a? Does he yeah, have a right. role? Can he? I mean, you're getting to that point because you only have a finite amount of roster spots and right. finite amount of a finite amount of, of, of pitching pitchers you're allowed to have on the roster too. Well, I yeah. guess I'm asking, can he be? A, is is it worth giving him the shot at those long relief appearances, <laughs> and like one last swan song, or are you just like, hey, we'd rather have Wesneski in that role? Yeah, I I Smiley. don't think it makes a ton of sense. Like he's not the kind of pitcher that you typically yeah. be, you know, making make that sort of transition. Um uh emotionally I'm not ready. Didn't, to... didn't Carlos Sambrano become the Cubs closer for like a, a for stretch a there at the end? Yeah, he did. <laughs> he did. Um he did. so but but I don't know. Um I, I think like the big wild card is not just that how good um uh, Hayden Wesneski has been in the rotation because it's it's fine. And even Wicks, like he was already in the rotation to start the year. Mm-hmm. Javier Saad yeah. wasn't supposed to be this good. He, you know, who knows what happens tonight against the Braves. Again, Braves make a lot of people look bad. That's mm-hmm. just what they do. But he, Saad's been incredible. You cannot possibly take him out of the rotation. And you're obviously not taking out Steele, uh, Shoda, or Tyon right now, who's also been good. So yeah. that's four like locks. And then you got young guys or Hendricks, and it's like, you know, you can't just the guys that have options. The thing is, you can option them to the minors with the understanding that, like, listen, you're going to be up and around and starting, and you're going to get innings no matter what bullpen or in Iowa, and then the rotation. Hendricks, you can't really do that with unless he wants to take the Jose Abreu route and you know go play in Iowa just because. But yeah. that just doesn't happen a lot. Um, and so I, I have no idea what they're going to do with him. Um, but I think that, like, you know, that that last start he made almost changes next to nothing for me. Like, his leash has to be extremely short, um, extremely tight. And if he gets blown up again, it's got to be like he never wasn't blown up because th- it, it was yeah. just like a, a blip of five innings that were okay. Um, nothing, nothing too impressive. So... I have no, no clue. I don't envy the Cubs having to make that decision. Um, everybody loves Kyle, you know, yeah. so it's it does, not going to be easy. It does kind of feel like in a way, once they're totally healthy, you know, with PCA and Belly and Saya and Hap, Bush, it's like they're almost almost like too deep. Like they had too many guys where you like you want guys yeah. in a groove and it's like, so what do you do? Is it kind of like you just – go horses for courses kind of thing where you just try to get deep into analytics and play matchups, like no matter whoever it is. And it's just like, Hey, like, I'm sorry, Hap, like you're not in the lineup today. Is that going to be a possibility where they just start platooning guys? Yeah. I mean, listen, it, it's already sort of happening, happening with Bush and Hap mm-hmm. a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I couldn't believe, and I, and I guess I understand, but when Nick Madrigal came up to bat for Michael Bush, it was against the lefty, and so like, okay. But if if we're really at if we're really at the point where Nick Madrigal is a better offensive option than our first baseman, yeah, I, come on, man, not great. What's, what's going on here? Yeah. That's not great. Um, and Hap is the same thing. Like, you know, I'm a huge Ian Hap guy. Always think he gets so much shit for just being a consistent three war player. Um, but uh, this year, it's been like brutally bad like brutally bad and he's moving down the order and sitting more often and if mike talkman's gonna you know get on base or walk 18 percent of the time and get on base as much as hap 
and can also hit lefties, then you know what are you going to do? You can't you can't just keep playing Hap, right? right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think you're right that the Cubs do seem to have like one extra player. I think it's pretty easy to say that like PCA could could easily go back to AAA mm-hmm. for a while um, if everyone's kind of humming. And it's not like he doesn't have offensive development left to go. Oh, he can right. be a plus base runner and defensive center fielder right now. I, we know that. And when it comes, when it you know, when it's August, September, and hopefully the playoffs, I mean, he's a hundred percent on the team because right. of what he can do. Um, but you could probably like buy everyone a little bit of evaluation time by sending him back to AAA Iowa, um, working on whatever. Um, see if he could just start to like, you know, it's like, oh man, these bums look nothing like big league pitching. Like, you know, maybe it starts looking like a tennis ball, gets a little confidence, whatever. Um, but yeah, they got to start doing that and they got to start doing it soon because, you know, if, if, if we're going to have like the lineup be just automatic outs, cause let's, I mean, let's think about it. the catchers haven't really been hitting, which whatever, not entirely their job, but they haven't. Hap's been struggling like crazy. Swanson has been struggling like insanely bad before he went on the injured list. Um, that's already three spots. Who am I missing? Um, right field is fine. First base, uh, yeah. uh, Michael Bush. So it's like a certain point, you know, you do have to start doing, you know, maybe what the Giants did, which is not just lefty righty splits, but like, okay, who can handle this guy's slider today? Okay, you're starting. And sorry, Michael Bush, I know it's a righty, but you're not playing today. Um, or or Ian Happ or whoever. Um, that's the only option. There's too many guys. Um, too many good guys and not enough, like, Elite. great guys, yeah. you know, which is what it is. Do you think that they would ever do like it's like a hockey thing, but it's like, hey, we're gonna make a hockey trade, or we're gonna we have like a you know a surplus of defensemen. We need another forward. Would they take a guy who's should be on most teams in the everyday lineup? They kind of just did that with Michael Bush. Well, that's what I, like the Dodgers did that. Yeah. Could you see the Cubs doing that to be like, hey, like this the best way for us to shore up our bullpen is to give away one to trade away one of our guys? Yeah, absolutely. And then who? who yeah. Yeah, for sure. But it might not necessarily, it could be like Alexander Canario. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, you could do that from like the triple A. Mm-hmm. Like that's a guy mm-hmm. that like, you know, honestly, I don't think he's a star player or anything, but 2020 through 2023 Cubs, he's probably starting. Yeah. And you don't know what he can be. Right. Um, and that's probably how they'll loosen up some of that space. Um, I don't think any of those younger, like, I, you know, it is weird. So many of the Cubs players are are rising through the higher levels of the minors now, the prospects. And so at a certain point, they're going to have to start trading those guys too because like a lot of them are young, but some of them aren't. And you can't just have Moises Ballesteros like just destroying double A pitching forever or Owen Casey, mm-hmm. you know, destroying triple A pitching forever. Um, Brennan Davis just has four homers in the last five days. Like he's an afterthought at this point, but like – another guy who's just kind of sitting there um, that just this, this buildup of like, yeah, these are all players that could theoretically start somewhere, but just aren't right now. It was like Nelson Velasquez last year too, yeah. um, before they traded him. I mean, it's the same, it's the same principle. Um, and yeah, it's, they call them baseball trades and not in yeah. baseball too, just like a big leaguer for a big leaguer, yeah. sort of different than what you're saying. But yeah, I mean, if there was ever a time to make, uh, big trades. It's not just in season when you're going for the playoffs, which the Cubs have been there before, but it's like, we're kind of, it feels like we're at the beginning of a window mm-hmm. here, right? Yep. A lot of young guys coming up, a lot of good guys already at the big league level. If Hoyer sees an opportunity to like trade for someone with more control than he usually does at the deadline and it requires a big league piece, then you do it in yep. addition to a prospect or whatever. And I don't think we've quite been in this position since like, 2015, 16, 17. Yeah. Team's not as good, but they were at the beginning of something there. And yeah. that's the idea. Well, at the end of the day, that's a good problem to have. Um, yeah. Since we will end on this, I guess, the last, uh, the only name from Iowa, the big name from Iowa that you didn't mention was Kate Orton. Does he have a future on this team? Uh, you know, we, we talked about the, you know, kind of the starting pitching depth that they have already. Is he a guy that's just going to be blocked this year? Or do you think he has uh, a call up in his future here this summer? No, I think he'll be up this year, um, and I think he'll be up in the rotation. Um, 
first of all, I mean, h- how can anyone look at what has happened this year and not think that there's going to be more injuries? Yeah. Yeah. There will be, you know, um, a- absolutely no problem. And, and, uh, I don't think he'll be up in the bullpen. Like, I don't think they're going to do what they've done with Ben Brown mm-hmm. for Kate Horton. I think he's going to be a, a true and true starting pitching prospect and, and, and big leaguer. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, when they bring him up is the big question because, you know, he's not – I don't think he's necessarily ready yet, but give him five, six starts in Iowa if he does well. There's no reason not to bring him up. And then there's a big difference between bumping, you know, Bobby Ersad or Jordan Wicks from the rotation to the bullpen or the rotation to Iowa for Kyle Hendricks as opposed to doing it for your best pitching yeah, prospect in the last right. 20 years. Yeah. Like, you know, Since prior. maybe Assad has more left in the tank, but – we got to see what Kate Horton has. And I'm not even doing one-to-one there. It could be anybody, yeah. but like, there's just a big difference between making room for Kyle Hendricks and making room for Kate Horton. Who's again, like yeah. legitimately the best pitching prospect they've had in forever. So uh, he's got to, he's got to prove it at Iowa still. I think he will. And then I think he's without a doubt, you know, um, up with the big league Cubs in the rotation second half of this year. Like that, I, that's what I think is going to happen. Okay. All right. Anything else from you, David? Yeah. Can uh, I interest you in Tim Hill? No, I don't want any. Don't <laughs> what want What any. about John Brebbia? Can I interest you in John Brebbia? <laughs> Maybe we could talk. Justin do you, Anderson. Do you have authority to make any of these trades? I do. I, I mean, I should okay. considering how shitty these players are. They should be playing on my travel team. Uh, Michael Kopech. Can I interest you in a Michael Kopech? Yeah, I'll take a Michael Kopech. Okay, you can have him. All right. Uh, he's yours. Great. I don't even want anything back. He's yours. You can just have him. <laughs> We're good. That's good. Nice little reclamation oh, project. Yeah, easy, easy there trade. There we go. See? All right. Yeah, yeah, you started saying he doesn't want it. And, and we ended up on a trade for Michael Kopech for nothing. Yeah, yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, I wish you were here in person. We could shake hands on it. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, all right, Michael. Do you want to uh, pump anything real quick? You know, Bleacher Nation, I feel like you guys are doing great work. Anything else besides that? No, Bleacher Nation. Um, check it out. Check it Read out. Read my stuff. Um, obvious shirts. Go buy one of those. Those are cool. I'm yep. wearing one right now. Yep, saw that. Uh, that's it. All right. Well, great. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. We need a little. Uh, we needed a bullpen guy for the Cubs for this for this episode. Yeah, so yeah, there we go. We're glad good. you glad you could join us. So thanks again, Michael. Walked out of here with Michael. All right, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> later, Mike. All right. See you later. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Excellent show, Ryan. Um, I think the best show we've done in a long time, and I think there is one glaring reason why. I I would agree. No, Eddie, we had a little bit. We had. I was going to say because Hinkle's here. Okay, if you want to throw it under, the <laughs> I knew where that was going. I like that answer still. Yeah, it was a trap. That was a trap. But yeah, it was great. Uh, that's that's it for the show. A couple quick notes: Bulls eleventh pick. They'll probably get some guy who will disappoint us, and the Hawks are getting sued again. Yeah, and the White Sox have won. I think. Uh, They've gone 500 their last 18 years. Hey, how about that? Like that? Yeah, how about, how about that? that, right? Everything. Moral victories. Every, They're hustling. Everything, They're hustling. Everything coming up. Everything coming up. This is a little, everything coming up, White Sox, Dave. Everything is. Yeah. I, I, I do. All right, that's the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.